Hello, brothers and sisters. Uh, oh, I am just at, as always, I think right now, I am so excited about the time that we are living in and how close we are to the rapture of the bride and what is just about to take place for God's people, which has me so filled with joy. And I want to encourage all of the brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, and uh, so bear with me one second. I've got to print out one more thing for you guys. I want to tell you right now. So what's very important is that uh, I have I've had another dream. Um, and it is just really stunning to me uh, just about how how many dreams I have been given by God. And uh, so let me pick the printer here, right here. And this is the last thing, because I think it's very important that, that I have everything. I was so excited. I didn't even have all my things together. So I want you to, uh, to be able to hear this. Well, let's talk about oh, Sister Paulette. So glad you can make it. Oh, I'm just so pleased. And uh, so what we got here, it's been so long since my last message, right? Well, we are going to talk about some continuing things and how this dream, this God dream, and it was with Jesus, and I just had it, uh, so I had it a few days ago. I actually, what is, for me, it is actually the 7th of April right now. Good Friday, right? But I had this dream three days ago, and on April 4th, again, for me. And so what I want to be able to do is I want to tell you this dream because it fits right in the what my last three messages. Actually, what can I say? The third message back, it actually had a base. And then I had to build on top of that one because there was just so much information available. And then I had to do another one on top of that one because yet more information that is coming in from dear brothers and sisters that are also being given pieces of this puzzle and, and helping me to be able to have a better understanding of just what the deeper meanings or other connections that my God dreams have, okay? So uh, before we start, let's start with a prayer. Oh my goodness, we need to be able to do this. We need Holy Spirit to, to really be in control here, to really uh, be able to guide our words, our thoughts. And, uh, and so let's do that now. Abba, our Heavenly Father, we are so amazed by you. We want to lift you up. You are worthy to be praised. You are worthy of all glory, and we just want to lift you up, praise you, tell you how much we love you with everything that's in us, and where we have fallen short of that. That is the desire that's in my heart. Put that desire in every heart of every person that is watching this now. Let them know just how soon it is for Jesus to come right now and to get his bride. I'm asking for you, Holy Spirit, that you are going to anoint these words, that you are going to impact the brothers and sisters that are hearing this, impact those that are curious, those that are 
coming by, those that you are drawing, Father, I'm asking for you to do that now and that we might be so ready and so filled with anticipation and joy for your coming, Jesus, that we can do nothing else except focus so completely on you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So ah, that that is so good. That's so good. Look, everyone else, if you if you have, I see other ones. Yes, rapture fish. And that's what I'm going to continue on right now. If you haven't seen the last message that I have done, I had I encourage you to do that. Now I have actually gotten uh, several emails from people, excuse me. Oh, thank you, Abba. Uh, gotten several emails from people that are asking me, where is that message? Well, I want you to understand that the majority of my messages are similar to this. They're all live streams. I do have a, uh, they have a default on YouTube where uh, the default is to show the videos that you have uploaded. But there is a tab at the top where you can see videos and then you can see the tab for live. Click on that live button and you will see dozens and dozens of my messages that I think will encourage you, lift you up, and, uh, and draw you into a deeper, more intimate relationship with Jesus. That is my prayer for you. Do that now, okay? All right. We have, there's so much dealing with this rapture fish. Let me start with a, a couple of things here. So let me give you a quick synopsis before we get into this as to what we're going to do this morning. And when I say this morning, I mean my morning, okay? Uh, we're going to cover some other things that some more rapture fish, some more 153s, some uh, things that were being seen uh, here and uh, other things that, that are being posted by brothers and sisters that are continuing to build on that. Uh, many others are seeing this uh, 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 today. And, uh, and, you know, it's popping up. So in other words, so many people are seeing this now. Brother Lori, yes, we may leave today. Oh my goodness, it is so close. And that's why I want to be able to cover this now. I, I am I'm so prompted to be able to tell you this, to, to just really try to get in messages and at the same time to go in a deep dive into one section, uh, one area of the word. And in that word, I'm going to give you uh, uh, an idea, and it's going to be about being born of God. Okay, so that's what we want to cover, because what's going to happen is there's going to be a rapture of the bride, and all members of the bride are going to be born of God. And we want you to be able to ask yourself to be fully convinced that you have been born of God and that you're ready to go. Amen? All right. So we're going to cover that, and uh, we're going to cover that in deep detail. But first, oh my goodness, another God dream with Jesus, with Jesus. I was just so moved by it. So let, let me, before I start with this, um, yesterday, uh, Brother Mike over at Repo Man 64 actually highlighted uh, the same person, uh, Brother Will Johanning. And I want to go ahead and mention him too, because he's emailed me several times and he's uh, added some rapture fish 153 confirmations uh, that I want to go ahead and be able to mention to you today because I, I think that it's it's very powerful. Uh, he mentioned it, of course, in the uh, the live chat in uh, my past message. So again, if you want to look at that, be sure and read 
the online chat too, because sometimes that's very uplifting and there are things that are in there that we can really benefit from. So let me start with this. The 153 days, April 9th is 153 days after this most recent blood moon. Well, we know that this most recent blood moon was on November the 8th of 2022. And we knew, and so here's one of the things I want to just kind of add on, just kind of as a sidebar. When we're looking at blood moon signs in the skies and that sort of thing, they portend, this is, this is what I'm submitting to you, they portend future events, okay? We can see the signs, that is signs that we are supposed to recognize in advance of the physical events that's actually going to happen on the earth if those events that we're looking for, if those signs in the sky are God signs in the sky. Do you understand what I'm saying? So in other words, we, I'm not saying that, you know, it can't happen at the moment that that occurs. But what I'm trying to say is that in general, I, I only see that the sign is given in the sky and those signs are supposed to be able to give the people the chance to be ready to kind of prepare themselves to be looking for a particular event that those signs are pointing to. Understood? All right. So from that aspect, the November 8th, 2022 uh, blood moon and everything that happened with that was absolutely stunning. Um, and uh, the I can see, so obviously, so people were thinking that the rapture of the bride might actually take place on that very day. But I have, you know, I'm just kind of thinking to myself, you know, uh, can that or is that, of course it can, but is it more likely that it's actually portending a future event? Ah, we see the sky. Remember Jesus said, look, you Pharisees, come on, you can see the signs in the sky, you see the weather and all of this stuff, and you can't see the signs of the times? Look, all these signs that you were supposed to see were me coming, and here I am now, right? You understand? Okay. So we want to be able to look at those signs and be able to see that. So it's very interesting that as we look at uh, Brother Will's uh, observation here, April 9th, what is that? That is Resurrection Day, and that's what I have been talking about. Again, like bookends uh, and those bookends going from February the 14th until uh, until April the 9th. And that's what I have been given up to this point, okay? Right before this dream we're going to discuss here in a moment. Well, so with all of these confirmations that have been just coming from all over the place, then we see how the 153 rapture fish, because that's what it means. Uh, that's out of the book of uh, John, chapter 21, verse 11. We've got the big catch of the 153 large fish. And that's very interesting, right? I encourage you to go over that. It's, it's oh my goodness, because we don't have a whole lot of time here. So I really seriously encourage you to take a look back. There's just so much information there, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on that. So I just want to give you these others. All right, so let's build on what we've already done so far. April 9th is 153 days after this most recent blood moon. If this blood moon that happened on November the 8th 
2022 was portending something future. And then we see that Resurrection Day is 153 days from this blood moon. Doesn't that seem like a, a sign in the sky to you? Doesn't that seem like something that really shows this? Well, this is what Brother Will had sent to me. He says, hi, Wayne. I have heard and seen your whole death experience testimony. I have shared it with many people because I felt it is the most compelling testimony I've personally ever seen in my life. Did any of your listeners notice Resurrection Day, April the 9th this year, is 153, oh my goodness, Holy Spirit, I feel it. 153 days after this most recent blood moon on 11-8-2022, 7 11 8 you know how that works. 153 fish, yes, rapture fish, amen. The fifth day of Passover on the Gregorian calendar. I saw you talk about your wedding day being on Resurrection Day, as well as being on the 17th. Well, April the 9th is Nisan 17 on the Hebrew calendar this year. Whoa! Maybe this was the hint from the five loaves and two fish. Sun is in Pisces during this day. Fifth day of Passover, April the 9th. Amazing. And I agree. I, I just... Think about that, brothers and sisters, the five loaves, two fish, and that's another interesting connection. Don't you see that? So the And the other thing, let me add to that, five loaves, what are those loaves? They're barley loaves, right? And so, uh, so and we know that the number five uh, stands for grace. And we have the two fish. The Pisces are the two fish that are connected uh, in the stars, right? That's that's what we want to be able to, uh, to discuss there. There's just so many connections here. And he didn't stop there. He also then followed it up with another, another one. And I like this one as well. He says, oh, the anniversary of Israel's first government with David Ben-Gurion is this May 8th, 2023. Israel turns 75. Abraham entered the promised land at 75 years old. I look at that as being our deadline date for the fig tree generation. I agree with that as well. If we see the fig tree generation as 74 years. And uh, and look, there's there's so much there, and that's another deep study in itself. Uh, our dear brother Aaron uh, and uh, uh, over there at God a Minute, um, he's just put out, he's been out in a live stream that he did yesterday, and then he followed up with an an additional live stream uh, to be able to add on to what we're looking here uh, as far as the numbers 23 pointing up, 24 pointing down. I really encourage you to look at that. But one of the things that I noted out of his uh, live streams there was one of the things that we talk about, the uh, dunging of the fig tree. And that's where there's a, a connection, a relation there. Um, and that is where the, you know, the, uh, the orchard owner comes out. He finds this one fig tree that is not doing anything. You can't eat on anything for it uh, for four years, right? Uh, and uh, three years then in the fourth year. Well, there's no fruit on this fig tree. And so as the parable goes, uh, the owner of the land is saying, well, what are we doing with this fig tree? It's not doing anything. It's not bearing any fruit. Go ahead and cut it down, right? And so 
what then happens is the 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 husbandman or the one who's taking care of the of the tree is saying, well, let's not do this yet. Let's wait one year. Oh my God. Thank you. Thank you, Amba. Thank you. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I want to get to that in just a second. One year. I want you to think about this one year. We're going to dung it, fertilize it, and we're going to see if we can get after one more year, we're going to do this. And if it doesn't bear fruit, then we're going to go ahead and cut it down, right? All right. We see and we understand that the fig tree is Israel. And, uh, and so with Israel, we would be looking at Israel being 74 years of age coming up. And that would be the fourth year of the... Um, of the um, fig tree not bearing any fruit. And then uh, I think that that ties in to the harvest and then the destruction to follow the, the time of Jacob's trouble. And that's where Israel is going to ultimately be cut down, I think. So you know, that's what we're looking at here. There, we could go on, but I don't, I don't want to try to take up too much time here because we got so much more to go. All right. So let me see about that. Just so many things. 153 rapture fish, brothers and sisters. And this Passover, if you haven't seen it, Passover in Hebrew, when you add up the letters, comes up to what? 153. You know, how could anybody try to just make all of these connections here? You can't. That's God incidences. There's no such thing as coincidences. So what happened in this dream that I just had right now? Uh, I... I just, oh gosh, it's a short dream, but let me tell you quickly. I was, of course, asleep, and this was on the uh, early morning of the 4th, and I awaken in the God dream, which is typically what happens, because sometimes if you're having, or at least for me, if you're having regular dreams, you know, you fall asleep and then you have these kind of black and white dreams. Sometimes it can be events of the day, that type of thing. Um, you, you've heard the, the uh, cheeky comments where they say, you know, you having pizza dreams and things like that, right? Okay. But this is very different. When I have God dreams, they are in bright color. I see things going on. It is hugely uh, uh, spiritual. It is hugely important because, well, I say important. I have recognized that they are important to me and they are important to Jesus, you know? So he's the one that's giving me these. And so I, I await and I have given many of them to you. And this is the time. It's been three days, but I had to get the other stuff out first. But here, this is going to add to it. So I wake up in this dream and I am standing. I'm standing on, it, it seems, so I'm standing on the earth, right? But in this particular instance, I'm standing on the globe of the earth, Sorry, other people, if you don't believe in a globe, but this is a globe from the dream. Just go with that, okay? So I'm standing, and I can actually see, because it's it's meant to be, I'm standing on top of the world, right? Okay, that's, that's the deal. To my left, so I'm always, this happens so many times when I see Jesus. Jesus is right to my left-hand side. I'm on his right-hand side. And he's wearing this same white robe that I discussed earlier on, okay? 
uh, in other messages, beautiful white robe, and I'm standing there and I'm looking. Now, the, uh, I don't see other people because it's not about that. What I recognize is that I am with Jesus and he's showing me something very specific and very uh, symbolic. So I'm looking out, even though I'm on the top of this globe, and that's the, the point is I'm actually on the very top. So think about this. Yes, wow, that just popped into, into, into my mind right now. Think about the, the roundness of the earth and what I was thinking. So I'm standing, think of that as a clock, okay? So the round earth is representing the clock. And so I am now standing right on top of it. You understand? So in other words, straight up 12 o'clock. I was talking about the midnight cry in, in, the, in this previous uh, event that happened to me for, uh, before. And, uh, and so what is, what is happening now is this is, I'm seeing this same type of symbolism and that's what it's recognizing for me. It is the 12 o'clock hour for the whole earth. Okay. That's what that's meaning. So he's showing me and he's talking to me. I'm looking out, so even though I'm looking out of the globe, I'm looking up at this beautiful blue sky, okay? And I can see some, you know, it's bright time daylight, which seems kind of strange, right? We recognize it's 12 o'clock or the midnight hour, but as still I'm looking out and it's bright and it's daylight. So we can see some connections, right? We are children of the day and not of the night. And that's what I get from that. All right. As I'm looking out and I'm seeing these beautiful little fluffy white clouds and everything, they're making kind of like a, a cloud layer, right? It's not completely across. There's just these fluffy white, beautiful white clouds. So it's almost like a just an early summer day, spring day, it's in, in that, where we are now, okay? That's, that's, what, that's what I can see. And as I'm sitting here, I'm looking up and I can see this. Now, the sky then goes on farther beyond these clouds that I can see floating in the sky. And in front of me appears a... Um, a step. Uh, it's almost like a, you know, a three-step type of platform. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay. Uh, but it's steps, and they are solid stone steps. Uh, chiseled in stone, right? Written in stone. Okay. So this one little set of one, two, three steps, right? appears in front of me on, on right at the same ground level with me. And then another one. And it connects on the top like Lego blocks, okay? Except they're not Legos. You, you understand what I'm saying. So there's the one, then another one, two, then another one, three, four, and so on. And they go all the way up to the base of these clouds. So it's right there at the cloud layer, right? And then Jesus tells me there are 20 of them. And I said, 20, three. And he said, yes, 23. And I woke up. Okay. So let me, and I knew, that's what I'm telling you, in several of these things, that, that was this short dream, but I knew that's what that meant. The time is up, right? There's that clock. There's that 12 o'clock hour. 
And that 23, as in 2023, that was the completion of the, and the, so each of these little ticks, right? Each of these little groups of three uh, actually represented a countdown. Uh, think about it like this way. When we have the Feast of Shavuot, right? The Feast of Weeks, we count these weeks. Now, this has nothing to do with weeks, but I'm just using this as an illustration. It's a countdown, right? You're counting up the weeks, but it's actually a countdown. So what I see this as being the uh, a very similar thing here, okay? And that is each step, each, and that each step of three steps was a countdown all the way. So what this went up to the, then was 2023. And so that meant multiple, there's multiple meanings here. It meant 2023 and at the base of the cloud level. So this wasn't a stairway to heaven. Ooh, again, forgive me for that. I had to say it, okay? Um, and, uh, but it didn't go all the way to heaven. It was specifically pointed out to me that it went up to that cloud layer. Why? Because when the bride is raptured up, it's to meet Jesus in the clouds. And so that's what's going to happen there. And the reason why it stopped, and Jesus is telling me that it's 2023 and there was no more. In other words, that's the end. We're there. That's this is this is the time. There were no more steps to add on to that. In other words, no more countdown. The countdown was complete. That 20th one, okay? All right. And so I, I was also trying to think. I was going like, okay, uh, what's, what's the deal with why, why a separate number 20? Why a separate number three in the steps? Is it 20 times three? That's six. And, you know, 60. And that's uh, the Completion number of man? Uh, no, I'm not thinking like that. Holy Spirit then said, Wayne, look up 20 in Strong's. Uh, like I said, I've only done that a couple of times lately. And so I'm like, yeah, yeah, let's check that out. So I looked up the number 20. I, and sometimes I don't think about these numbers as being low numbers, right? And those uh, we usually think about them in hundreds or thousands, but obviously it has to start with one, right? So anyway, the, the word uh, is agalysis, right? That means exaltation, exuberant joy, wild joy, ecstatic delight, rapture ecstatic delight, exaltation, exhilaration. Brothers and sisters, can you see what this is? That rapture is going to be exactly that. The final step, 2023, it is now going to happen. And I am just, I was just like, oh, oh, exuberant joy, intense joy and gladness. Do you think that's what's going to happen? Do you think that's what rapture actually is and what it means? Oh, my goodness. That's what imminent? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, I believe so. And I wanted to talk then about, let's talk about this imminency for a second and this one year. I find it very interesting how Abba has had me do this channel and, and how it started uh, and uh, what all you know, the bookends, everything that was over and over. The entirety of my channel has been one year, 
I've been doing this for one year. And so, and it started in the winter and it's ending at the end of winter, right? So you, you can see where all of this is fitting in. I am seeing now, as I look at it separately, of course, I didn't see all of this initially, but I look at it now and I'm going, I can see the connection with the one year, this final year to be able to show the, uh, Israel, that fig tree, you, you had one more year and now that year is over. And I really think that that is in fact the case. Uh, we tie that in here and there's so much more, of course, I encourage you, like I said, if, if you haven't had an opportunity to see any of my previous messages, we're there. And I, and like I said, I've said that numerous times about being able to say that we're there. Imminency, when we're talking about this from God's standpoint, one year and people are saying like, well, no, imminent should be five minutes from now, right? Let's look at it if we can from God's perspective, right? One year after 2000 years, I think that would qualify as imminent. Wake up your bride, let's get them ready. And you will also find I have never discussed anything other than barley being the first harvest, always wheat, being the second harvest, always. And then the fruit, grapes, the crushing of the grapes happening last, okay? I haven't wavered from that. Abba has never given me anything different from that. And I am not going to change or try to, you know, uh, conform or modify anything that I have been given because I'm, I'm wanting to be obedient, brothers and sisters. That's, that's the point. And the bride is the barley. And, I, and I, if you look around, you can see how many more people are starting to recognize that. I'm glad. I'm so glad. And uh, so... Let's then go ahead and talk about then for a minute about dates, okay? Let's talk about dates. Now, uh, I, I know that we have so many of those that just get all bent out of shape. No, 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 we can't discuss dates. No man knows the day or the hour. And all, all that I've said about that is, well, it no man will know the day or the hour for the post-tribulation harvest. They sure won't. And, uh, uh, but that doesn't necessarily apply to the children of the light and children of the day that are watching and looking for this. That again is so deep and you can look at some other things. Now I'm not asked looking at the specific date in this instance. The reason I'm mentioning a date is from the standpoint of calendars. Now here, uh, I want to look at calendars as it, from the Jewish perspective, okay? Because it's important for us to look at, at both sides of this equation. And the reason why I'm looking at this from the Jewish perspective I want you to have an understanding of why the post-tribulation harvest, they certainly don't know the day or the hour. And why is this? Okay. Now, what I'm going to use here to talk about this is actually from Deborah's date tree. Uh, and if I'm subscribed to her channel and she uh, she discusses about um, the timing, uh, about the uh, Abib barley and those types of things, being able to determine the beginning of the month, the beginning of the year, and so forth, in order to be able to properly 
get the dates for the specific feast days, all right? Now, I'm going to excerpt uh, out of this, and, and, and if you haven't seen her, I encourage you to go check her out, subscribe to the channel, because there's a lot of interesting information that you are going to be able to glean post-tribulation, looking, okay, from this. So I would encourage you to do that. Um, all right, Devorah, that's D-E-V-O-R-A-H, right? Devorah's date tree. All right, so here's what she says. This is in one of the last uh, messages that I got from her. And she says, dear friends, some of you have asked whether I could explain when the Pesach, the Passover sacrifice, would have been brought and why some begin the Feast of Unleavened Bread on April the 5th, 2023. Now, let me preface this by reminding you that I'm personally planning, this is Deborah, on beginning the year with the upcoming new moon on April 20th or 21st, 2023. I want you to peg it. That should peg your ears up. Right? What? And that it may be best to simply ask someone that you know who began a, a Feast of Unleavened Bread on April the 5th and why they chose to do so. However, if you ask me, because it's not possible to do for whatever reason, I can try and share with you what you think is going on. Uh, and she goes on to then discuss why she's thinking that uh, that it would happen on April the 5th. She discusses uh, when she's looking at the Abib barley. I want to pass all that up and go into this. She says it's important to understand that most people who observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread follow the rabbinic calendar. And the Rabbinites began the Feast of Unleavened Bread on, the, on April the 5th at sunset. Then there are those who say they follow the biblical calendar, but don't begin the month based on the sightings of the new moon from Israel. Some of those arguments include the following, and these are very, very interesting, brothers and sisters. One, the new moon would have been visible on March 22nd were it not for overcast. The truth is we can't be certain the new moon would have been visible were it not for the overcast, and the moon only had an illumination of 1% and a lag time of 55 minutes. This is her uh, uh, narrative. Furthermore, I don't think we are supposed to speculate about such matters. The fact is that the new moon wasn't sighted, and I don't think we should assume that atmospheric obstructions, such as overcast, aka acts of God, are a mistake. Rather, I believe we are supposed to look for the new moon and trust that if we are meant to see it, it will be revealed. And that's why I believe the ancient Israelites would have done the same, right? That's her intention. All right, second argument. Now, so you can see what she's saying. So this other part of this one other group, they're, they're saying like, okay, yeah, we would have seen it because that's what we would have seen on Solarium, right? Okay. So, or we could have looked at the particular forecast. It should have been here. So that's why we're going to go ahead and look then. Well, what's the second argument? The second argument is we should begin the month based on the local new moon. All right, she responds. My understanding of this argument is that when we travel through the desert prior to entering the land of Israel, we presumably began the months based on the local new moon. So why can't we continue doing so today? My response to that is that once we entered the land, we were instructed to follow the commandments of the land in the land. That's Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 1, which would include the setting of the biblical calendar. 
If you try to set the biblical calendar based on signs, that's Genesis 1, verse 14, outside of Israel, you may begin the year in the wrong month and the month on the wrong day. Okay. Then there's the third argument. The month begins with conjunction. All right, her response. Then there are those who suggest that the month doesn't begin with sighting of the new moon, Genesis 1, verse 14 again, but rather with conjunction when the moon can't be seen for between one to three days. Uh, that argument just boggles my mind. What? Okay. More specifically, the moment of conjunction, which I guess they think the ancient Israelites knew how to calculate. Today, we can just Google it and we can see that conjunction in Jerusalem was on March 21st at 7.23 p.m. And so they have declared the month to have started at sunset on March 21st, 2023. And I presume began the Feast of Unleavened Bread on April the 4th at sunset. So what I'm wanting, the, the point that I'm highlighting here, brothers and sisters, is that even within the Jewish community, here we have all of these particular times to start the beginning of the year. None of it is actually in line with what we have in Exodus 12 that says this is going to be the beginning of months for you, meaning Nisan. And then as uh, Brother Mike has pointed out on a number of his messages in Repo Man 64, I encourage you to go and subscribe to him, that uh, the uh, March 16th of every year since the time of creation and on through the millennial reign is March 16th, the day, day of equal parts. And that is the equilux, right? And that occurs just a few days before the equinox, which means day of equal night. Or excuse me, that's the equal night, parts of equal night, okay? And then uh, equilux is the parts of equal day. That's the, that's the point there. Equal, equal day parts, equal, uh, equinox, equal night parts, right? But we're children of the day, aren't we? Right? So wouldn't we be looking at the equilux like other children of the day would be looking? That's my point out to you. And here's my other point that I would like to make as it relates to this. I hope now that you would be able to gain an understanding of why our enemy has been trying to change seasons and laws. That's to get everybody just like this on a different, you know, different groups, nobody agreeing on, well, something is going to start here, some over here, and no one's on the same page, you see. But one of the things that I also note is that in every instance from the Israel side, they are beginning it by looking at the moon and not looking at the sun. Now, they're going to say, oh, we've got the civil calendar, we've got the biblical calendar. But once again, I have to go back to we are, we as Christians, those that are saved by the blood of Christ, those people, those are the sons of the day and not of the night. I, I would encourage you to look at that from that standpoint. Consider that. So would Israel right now be sons of night? Hmm? I think a very interesting thing, right? All right. And we're not quite finished with this yet. Okay, because what she gives, and and I just want to go, you know, it's just so mind numbing when you look at all of these different ones, and then you compare it to what would we do from the equilux? Well, you can set the Sabbath 
every Sabbath. And just as, again, Brother Mike pointed out, in this year, all of the Sabbaths would be on a Thursday. But every Thursday, we would know for the entire year, it's going to fall on every Thursday. Why? Because the day of equal parts was on March 16th, making March, and March 16th would be the last Sabbath of the year, making March 17th Nissan 1. Are you following me? Okay. Now, we can look at that and how easy is that to be able to follow? You don't have to pull out a calculator and go, so I'm going to have to double by that. This is the square root of, and the moon is over here. The sun is up. Over. Okay. Now, if we go, you see what I'm saying? You, you would go like, are you kidding me? Right? God would want a couple of million people who are trying to be able to follow what God is doing with them after crossing the Red Sea and all of this, he's going to make it easy enough for all of them to follow. And why then would he also, if you're considering this, if it was this difficult to, to, to do all of these machinations, then how would it be, how would you, how would a reasonable person, I'm trying to look at this from a reasonable standard, that's, that's what a, a lawyer would do, right? Yeah, okay, so I'm not saying that that's the case, but Jesus is our advocate, so I'm trying to look at it from that standpoint. How are you going to be held accountable to do something when nobody is actually in agreement on it, and it is so complicated that, you know, why do we know how easy, isn't the 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 gospel in its global sense it's easy to understand wouldn't you agree it, it, it doesn't sometimes we don't know why god chose to do it the way he did but it is easy to understand he didn't make it so difficult that you have to have an engineering degree in order to be able to try to parse it you understand all right so he would also make this easy for the uh, Hebrews that came out of Egypt, he's going to make it easy for them to follow and understand. And so, and you also, where did we look? We see the uh, four star Pegasus, right? The, the lowest star in the horizon, Algenib. It just skirts right along the horizon there on March 16th, when you see that, then, of course, you look at what the sun is in. Wait a minute, sun? Did we say moon? No, we did not. We said sun. Why? We are children of the day. We are not children of the night. We would expect that children of the night would be using the moon. You, you see where I'm going with this? I'm taking a different twist or different, not a twist, because I'm not twisting the word of God. But you can understand, G, uh, the Israel is in disbelief. And we know that unbelievers are, they live in darkness, right? So this is not uh, taking this out. I'm just adding this other layer of understanding on the children of the day, because it says that the children of the day will know, right? Those that are of the night, they won't know. But those that are of the day, they will know, okay? All right, so let's talk about, like, I want you to see this. I, I'm going to uh, point out, I, I took a little snapshot, and this is all credit to Deborah, okay? And let's see if it can, we can get it in focus for you. Okay. All right. So let's talk about this a minute. This whole page are discussing various scenarios of when the Feast of Unleavened Bread would be. You, you can't just count, you know, 14 days from the first, you know, first of Nisan. March 17th, what is that going to be? 
Well, the Jews always want to have the day fall on Saturday. Why? I, I don't know. It makes them feel better, right? I, I don't know. But uh, when God created the days, he didn't have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, right? That's Saturn's day. He used one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? There's a reason for that. So that you're not doing exactly what is happening now. But let's cover these scenarios of when this might occur. So if you look at that, when is the potential holiday dates according to the first month? Well, if you are of the group that has their new moon observation on March 22nd, 23rd, then that would be the first day of uh, unleavened bread. And then the, uh, okay, let me just, uh, let me just cover these because I don't want to cover all these in deep detail. You, you can go and see this when, if you go to her site. But she points out, so we've got, what, four scenarios that are listed. Okay, new moon observation, March 22nd, 23rd. Guess what? So that would be uh, the, uh, uh, the first day of Hag Hamatzot, according to that. But the new moon wasn't sighted on March 22nd, 2023. So that brings up a second scenario. If the new moon is sighted on the 23rd of March, then uh, we've got sunset April the 6th until sunset April the 7th. Then Passover sacrifice would be brought at sunset on April the 6th. Uh, counting of the, uh, let's see, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Hanafat Ha'omer, that's the wave sheep offering, I guess. Uh, that's on April the 9th. And it goes sunset April the 12th on the, for the second, uh, seventh day of uh, unleavened bread would be sunset April the 12th to sunset April the 13th. Well, let's cover these other ones. What about the new moon being sighted uh, if you have to add another month because the barley wasn't a bee? So they're including these observations. The new moon observation, April 20th to 21st. Wow, okay. Or what if we're considering second Passover, right? So we have the second Passover that happens the month after the first Passover. So we can see there's also uh, a harvest potential there, a rapture of the bride potential. Uh, so then they've got their days there. Scenario three, well, what if the new moon is sighted on the 20th of April? Then they cover those. But if the new moon is sighted on the 21st of April, then you've got the Passover sacrifice would be on sunset May 5th. You follow me. It, it just gets so complicated, so convoluted. How could anybody do that? And is it any surprise that the enemy would have been the one behind this? And it's almost like I get this idea that you've got you know, this big group of people and, and, and they've been having this big discussion, you know, here's hundreds of people and you've got them up there and they're saying on the big, uh, big screen and they're saying, you know, we could have this particular scenario here and, uh, and this is everything there. But if in this circumstance, we can have scenario two, you see anything? And they go through all these scenarios. And then you see this tiny little hand way at the back raises up, and and it's a it's a it's a a, a child, and this child holds, holds up his hand, and the person up there on the platform says, "Well, I think we have a question there at the back," and uh, and 
uh, and he says, yes. And so this little child stands up and says, can't we just start the day like we did every day for 2,000 years on March 17th? Then you hear all this murmuring and everything in the crowd. You, know, you see what I'm saying? Sometimes it's that simple, folks. Uh, and we have to receive the kingdom as little children. And you're not going to ha expect a little child to understand and be able to do calculus in general. I mean, we, we can have a prodigy, uh, but you understand what I'm saying here is making it simple so that we can follow the uh, commandment to honor the Sabbath day and make it holy. Well, doesn't that make it holy when we look at it always happening on the same day every year at the same time with the same sign? That's what we would want to do. All right. I hope that that makes it uh, kind of clear, but it also shows then why we need to be able to try to come down to the simple understanding of God's calendar. So I encourage you to check out Brother Mike there at uh, uh, Repo Man 64, and you will learn a lot about that. I, I re it really resonated with me. I really felt uh, convicted and that it was a confirmation. Yeah, what is this? And when I was pointed out, you are children of the light and of the day and not of darkness. And I was going like, wait, sun, day, not Sunday. Sun equals day, moon equals night. And then I saw, that's what I think that I saw. I hope you see that. All right, so that's our first hour. And I hope that that's encouraging to you because once again, when you go by that, you can see where we're in that period right now. We're in that period. So I, I think that you want to be able to do that. But here's the next question for hour number two. Will it make any difference for you if you're not born again or not born of God? And that's what we're going to talk about right now. And the simple answer of that question I'm going to submit to you is no. And here's, here's this what I want to do. Before I want to go into this uh, part of the study, I want to be able to relate part of what happened to me in my salvation experience. I was miraculously healed of very obvious chicken pox all over my body, uh, and they were instantly gone. And, uh, and that was because I was being obedient to God to go there and one, receive my healing both physically and spiritually. And that's what happened. Um, if you haven't heard my salvation experience, I encourage you to check that. That's also on the on the channel as well. And so and I believe that that is actually one of the videos. So you can check that out from the video standpoint. That's part two. Um, and so here's what occurred in that moment that's relevant to what we're going to be discussing here. And that is when I was being filled with Holy Spirit, it was so massively powerful. And in I could see I began to be enveloped in this pink mist. Everything, all of my surroundings, everything disappeared. And I entered this loving realm. Like I say, it was all I can say, it was like a pink mist. And I was being just completely poured over in love, uh, God's love. 
okay? And this was seven days right before my first afterlife experience. As I'm in here, and, and it's interesting, I was in this, uh, apparently from the outsider's view, I was in this ecstasy. I was speaking in tongues nonstop. I didn't know anything about it. I thought I was just talking with God. I was. Uh, and, uh, uh, and it was uh, Abba, Father. And I say Abba because this is what happened. While I was in there, they said I was in this state for four hours. Four, number of the door. Dalet. To me, it was only a couple of minutes. I, I mean, it, I couldn't tell any time, but it certainly wasn't four hours to me. But apparently, yes, it was. And uh, and the whole church had already finished. Uh, there had been 32 people that had been baptized in the Holy Spirit and received their actual baptism right there, including me at the time. And I could, it was just so surreal. But as I was in here, I could hear the voice of God as father. And he says to me, Wayne, today I have begotten you. And I said, what? And he said it again. And I knew that was true. Okay. Now, let me stop there and kind of give a little indication. Now, there have been a number of people that had made comments. It just bristled them to no end. Whoa, no, there's no one begotten of the Father except Jesus who do you think you are? And, and similar type of comments, some even far worse than that. Well, I'm sorry. That's what God told me. And that's when I had, that's where I became son and he became Abba. But we're going to talk about this begotten thing, right? And it is, uh, we're going to do this, this one uh, type of teaching here. And uh, I understood exactly what, what Abba was saying. He said, I was at that moment, I was born again. I was born by him. Okay. All right. Now, is that in line with the word of God? Yes, it is, okay? And that's what we're going to study right now. So what does, so I'm going to go ahead and kind of change it here, saying we're going to talk about being born of God. Is that biblical? What does that mean? And uh, what words are actually used? Now, for this particular study, I've, I've got as a basis, because i got a lot of scriptures here, that I pulled off of the BibleMadePlain.com. And so I'm able to use, the, the, they pulled a lot of these scriptures together for me. So that helps me out. Uh, so I can get these words to you. All right. And the first thing I want to say in a read, it says, in the KJV, and in New King James, the term born of God appears several times, once in the Gospel of John and seven times in five verses in the first epistle of John. And so what I'm going to do first is I'm going to read you one of the verses, then I want to give you a definition and then we're going to go back to this, okay? Because it's very important. John 1, verse 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. 
to those that believed in his name, verse 13, and were born, and that term there for born is genao, okay? That is Strong's 1080, 1080, genao, okay? We're going to discuss that in a minute. Let me finish the verse. John 1, 13, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God, okay? Now, we're going to, uh, what I want to point out in all of these scriptural references, the word there being translated as born is that same word, genao, Strong's 1080. So let's take a look at that for just a moment. So Strong's 1080, it's a variation of 1085. It's pronounced genao. Properly, it means to procreate properly of the father, but by extension of the mother. Figuratively, to regenerate, to bear, to beget, be born, bring forth, conceive, be delivered of, gender, make, or spring, right? Uh, and under Thayer's Greek lexicon, it has several different uh, uh, meanings of it. Ganao, one, of men who fathered children, one A, to be born, one B, to be begotten, okay? You want to highlight that. 1B1, of women giving birth to children. 2, metaphorically. 2A, to engender, cause to rise, excite. 2B, in a Jewish sense, of the one who brings others over to his way of life, to convert someone. 2C, of God making Christ his son. 2D, of God making men his sons through faith in Christ's work. So I want to, there's, and, and just so you know, I went and copied all of these scriptures where this occurs. Uh, I'm not expecting you to, uh, to go to check all of these. I'm just saying, and there's two pages of it. There's a lot of them. So, and they're all using this same word, okay? And I'm highlighting the word begotten is the word proper. It's a proper translation of this word, genao, where they're just using the word born in the KJV, okay? But let's continue. Let's go back here now, and let's go back and read these other instances. And, uh, and so 1 John chapter 3, verse 9. Whoever has been born, genao, of God, does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born, genao, of God. Okay? 1 John 4, verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born, genao, of God and knows God. 1 John 5, verse 1. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born, genao, of God. And everyone who loves him, who begot also, loves him who is begotten of him. Okay? 1 John 5, verse 4. For whatever is born, genao, of God, overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Amen. 1 John 5, 18. We know that whoever is born, genao, you noticing a pattern here, of God, does not sin. But he who has been born, genao, of God, keeps himself and the wicked one does not touch them, okay? Now, what I want to go back and do is since we've actually seen where begotten is used, and that is also a proper translation of this uh, word that's being translated born in the KJV, let's go 
and change that word born to begotten, shall we? All right. And let's see what it, does it change any meaning? Nope. Let's go. John 1, verse 12 and 13. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were begotten, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God, begotten of God. 1 John 3, 9. Whoever has been begotten of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been begotten of God. 1 John 4, verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is begotten of God and knows God. 1 John 5, verse 1. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is begotten of God, and everyone who loves him who begot also loves him who is begotten of him, right? 1 John 5, verse 4. For whatever is begotten of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. 1 John 5, 18. And we know that whoever is begotten of God does not sin, but he who has been begotten of God keeps himself and the wicked one does not touch him. Okay? Now, we it, it, there is no problem with that at all. But I think that there is a little trip up. They're saying, some might say, ah, but that's only talking about Jesus. Because, you know, Jesus is the only one begotten of the Father, which it doesn't say that. We'll cover that in more detail in a moment. But, you know, whoever is begotten of God does not sin. Ah, that's got to be Jesus because he does not sin. He's never sinned, right? You see where that is going on that? But we're going to go in farther and we're going to actually see that's not what that says at all. That's not what it implies, okay? Uh, so what does that term mean? So the question is, is that a correct translation to call it born or should we use begotten? Many translations differ and use the term begotten of God. Why do you think they would do that? Okay. Or even generated from God. I, I don't care too much for that translation. I'm going to generate it from God. That seems so, you know, I don't know, like lab created. No, I don't want anything like that. We need to look at the meaning of the Greek word translated born, which is genao, as I've mentioned before. According to Strong's Concordance, genao can mean bear, be born, beget, conceive, and all of those, right? And so we have a couple of verses from that. So like, for example, in Luke 1.13, it says, But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear there's that term again, ganao, you, a son, and you shall call his name John. So in that contextual passage, that means to be born. Uh, Hebrews 11, verse 23. By faith, Moses, when he was born, ganao, was hidden three months by his parents. That means to beget or to father, right? You can see where this is going. Matthew 1, verse 1, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Matthew 1, verse 2, and we can go into all kinds of begets, right? Abraham begot Genaho, Isaac, Isaac begot Genaho, Jacob, and Jacob begot Genaho, Judah, and his brothers, meaning to conceive. Uh, Matthew 1, verse 20, so that we can go past all the begetting, all right? But while he, Joseph, thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, 
for that which is conceived ganaho in her is of the Holy Spirit. So what I want you to be able to see is that in all of the verses that we listed in the beginning, ganao should be or would prop would more properly it would be more appropriate to have translated it with the term ganao with begotten. Okay. Uh, there's an additional poor translation in 1 John 3, verse 9, and 1 John 5, verse 18. These two verses have, whoever has been or is genaho, begotten of God, does not sin. Whoever, and in 1 John 3, verse 9, whoever has been genaho, born of God, does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he's been born Genaho of God. Uh, in 1 John 5, 18, we know that whoever is born Genaho of God does not sin, but he who has been born Genaho of God, excuse me, keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. John is, he's quite plain when he uh, points out in the same epistle, this, this same letter, that all Christians sin, right? And need forgiveness of sin. So what do we see? First John 1 verse 8 says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Verse 10. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So 1 John 1 verses 8 through 10 state that Christians, that is those who have been genaho, begotten of God, still sin. John is not going to contradict himself a few chapters later by writing whoever is genaho of God does not sin. Therefore, the phrase does not sin is an inaccurate translation. And uh, it should be translated, whoever is begotten of God does not practice sin. And who or whoever is genao of God does not continue to sin. As many translations such as the NIV, NLT, ESV, NASB, and a few other alphabet soup uh, translations, if you'll forgive me for that. So the whole point of that is if you if you take some of these things and the, the translation, it, it needs to have a strong, strong translation uh, uh, that's clear enough or plain enough for us to understand. God is not going to contradict himself in the in, in, in his word. And he's certainly not going to contradict himself within the same letter, just a few chapters away from each other, right? So, and, and if you go into the Greek study, you understand that that's what the term actually means, that you don't continue to sin, you don't uh, practice sin, that's, that's what it is. But we still sin, and we still need to seek um, forgiveness for that sin. So what do we see out of this? The term born of God is a mistranslation and should instead be translated begotten of God. This becomes apparent when considering the process of salvation, right? So it starts by receiving God's Holy Spirit, being begotten, and culminates in the resurrection to eternal life, right? So that's uh, that's that's what it is. I, I would say that being born again, that's actually what happened. That is when you are begotten. You are begotten. You are born of God. And it says that you have to be uh, born of water and the spirit, right? That's, that's what being born again is all about. 
And I suggest that that's what the case is. But let's talk about those and close this out uh, on what, what, what do we do with this uh, term about Jesus being God's only begotten son, right? We really want to cover that. Uh, and, and does that in any way take away from what we just covered? And I will answer that in the negative. No, it is not. From this, I, I went to uh, gotquestions.org, and I think that this is laid out uh, very simply and is easy to understand. So the question as it's posed is, what does it mean that Jesus is God's only begotten son? <clears throat> Especially in light of all of these things, you know, but the begotten sons of God. Answer, the phrase only begotten son occurs in John 3.16, which reads in the King James Version as, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And many of us already know that, and that's where we get that. Wait a minute. So the phrase only begotten translates the Greek word monogenes, okay? The word is variously translated into English as only, one and only, and only begotten. It is this last phrase only begotten that's used in the KJV, NASV, and the New King James that causes problems. Now, false teachers have latched onto this phrase to try to prove their false teaching that Jesus Christ isn't God. And I can tell you firsthand, brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ is God. I met him. I was filled with him. I am filled with him. I know for a fact you cannot deny it. It is unquestionable when you are face to face with him that he is God. Okay, so well, let's continue on. I'm not asking you to believe me just because of my experience. I'm just asking, I'm just telling you that is my testimony and that's what I'm giving you. But here we're going to actually see it shown by the word of God. Uh, so, uh, it says that false teachers have latched onto this phrase to try to prove their false teaching that Jesus Christ isn't God, i.e. that Jesus isn't equal in essence to God as the second person of the Trinity. They see the word begotten, and they say that Jesus is a created being because only someone who has a beginning in time can be, quote, begotten, unquote. What this fails to note is that begotten is an English translation of a Greek word. As such, we have to look at the original meaning of the Greek word, not transfer English meanings into the text. So what does monogenes mean? According to the Greek-English lexicon of the New Testament and other early Christian literature, monogenes has two primary definitions. The first definition is, excuse me, pertaining to being the only one of its kind within a specific relationship. This is its meaning in Hebrews 11:17, when the writer refers to Isaac as Abraham's only begotten son. Abraham had more than one son, but Isaac was the only son that he had by Sarah and the only son of the covenant. Therefore, it is the uniqueness of Isaac among the other sons that allows for the use of monogenes in that context. The second definition is pertaining to being the only one of its kind or class unique in kind. This is the meaning that's implied in John 3, 16. You can also look at John 1, 14 
in 18, chapter 3, verse 18, 1 John 4, verse 9, for it says, John was primarily concerned with demonstrating that Jesus is the Son of God. And that is the focus in, in the entire book of John is the divinity of Jesus. And he uses monogenes to highlight Jesus as uniquely God's Son, sharing the same divine nature as God, as opposed to believers who are God's sons and daughters. Uh, and now they say by adoption here, I take issue with that. I can actually do another study, which, and they just take me on this. This will be a little tickler. We are not adopted as sons. We are born by God. That is how you become in the family, being born of God. The uh, whole issue about adoption like I said, I've got a whole other study on that, but just, and we're not going to cover it now, but it's the spirit of adoption actually should have been translated inheritance. A lot, uh, I'm not going to cover that here, but we become uh, sons because we are begotten of God. And, uh, and so that's the thing, but Jesus is uniquely different as God's son, because he shares God's essence. He, he is equal with God, uh, of a God, Father. So anyway, um, no, 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 no. let me get back here. Uh, that Jesus is God's one and only son. Okay, the bottom line is that terms such as father and son, and I think this is kind of the important point, descriptive of God and Jesus are human terms that help us to understand the relationship between the different persons of the Trinity. If you can understand the relationship between a human father and a human son, then you can understand in part the relationship between the first and second persons of the Trinity. The analogy breaks down if you try to take it too far and teach as some pseudo-Christian cults, such as uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, that Jesus is or was literally begotten, as in produced or created by God the Father. And that happens not just in this, there's uh, the same type of breakdown in the analogy when you say that, oh, okay, Jesus is coming back. He's, he's marrying one female woman personage. And uh, it's because you are trying to take all of this and put it into strictly physical human terms. But that is not what the body of Christ is. That's not what was revealed. That's not what the bride of Christ is. And, uh, and, and it does not uh, comport with any of those things. If you see that you are taking symbols uh, or principles that are spiritual principles, such as the spiritual principles that are presented in the parables, as an example, you are going to get them wrong, right? If you are then wanting to put everything in these physical terms, when you're actually when Jesus is actually trying to give us a spiritual principle, it's not going to work. Okay, and that's what I'm wanting to tell you here. So ultimately, what do we have? You become a son or daughter, uh, which is still a son, and that's another issue in itself. Uh, when you are begotten of God, there is no uh, there is no problem with that, none at all. Jesus is the only begotten monogenes, right? The only one of his kind with a specific relationship that is not shared by his other begotten sons and daughters, such as you and I. That's what I'm saying. Do you see? Um, it's it that is what it is that is what it is um all right let's go ahead and in that here 
I want to go ahead and just say, look, if you if you don't know this father and you don't know, more importantly, this son, then you are not going to be able to take part in any of this, in any of this. And your part has already been uh, set out for you. And it's not good. It is for an eternal separation from God. And you don't want that. God loves you. And he's, he's already paid this gift as Jesus on the cross, paid a debt sin, a sin debt, excuse me, that you couldn't pay. But he did it. He understood you couldn't pay it. And he did it for you because he loves you so much. I've experienced that love. I saw him on the cross. I know this to be true. And he did it just for you as if you were the only one in all of creation. And he would have done it just for you and me and everyone else listening to this message. You want to know this Jesus. And if you don't know him right now, these are, this is what you should do. First, you have to believe. You can't believe that he's just some physical man that died on this cross. That, not, that physical man is not who he was. He was eternal God with the Father throughout, you know, days innumerable, eternity past. And he manifested in the flesh for the sole purpose of being able to, uh, to pay that sin debt. He died on that cross, was buried, and he rose again back to life after three days. And he's alive forevermore. Amen. And if you want to know this Jesus, and I pray you do, oh my goodness, he loves you so very much. I'm asking for you to do that now. Say, Jesus, I believe you are the son of God and that you paid that sin debt for me. I can't pay it. And you did. And I received that free gift. It's a free gift. And I say, thank you, Jesus. I give you my life completely. I'm asking you to cleanse me. I'm asking you to save me. I'm asking you to make me uh I want you to make me clean, cover me with your precious cleansing blood. And from as a result of what you did on that cross and take me, take me, save me. And uh, I, I think that that's, you are going to, there's nothing. I, I get so tongue tied even trying to think about it because it is so beyond it, it is so beyond comprehension and understanding that the God of all creation loves you enough and wants to make you part of his family, God's own sons and daughters. And you can be born again. You can be begotten of God when you say yes here. And you say, come into my life, Jesus. Come into my heart. Save me. Holy Spirit, I'm, I'm saying yes. Jesus, I'm saying yes. Father, I, I want to call you Father. Yes, that's all. You get it? You get it? He loves you that much. And I want to see you. I want to see you with the rest of the family and the rest of the bride that is just about to be taken up. Amen. If you've done that, please let us know. Let somebody know. Let somebody know. You can tell us in the comments and, that's, and that sort of thing. Tell someone in your family. Just, just let somebody know that you've made that decision, that you have done that. It is a done deal. You have been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, and you are now a part of the family. Amen? All right, let's look up. And be ready because that trumpet is about to sound, brothers and sisters. And I look so forward to seeing you so very soon. God bless you. Maranatha. Bye-bye now.